وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا Your brothers and sisters, as we come now to the final lesson in the life of Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, I want to emphasize that you could literally spend 50 or 60 weeks with Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu and you would not finish. His seerah is extensive in every way. You could learn taqwa from Umar radiallahu anhu, piety from Umar. You could study Islamic history through Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu because as we talked about last week, in that decade of his khilafah, Islam spread to almost every majority Muslim country that we know today. You could talk about his iman and his lessons in faith and truth seeking. You could talk about any of the virtues that we covered in the second lecture of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. You could also talk about legal precedents, the fiqh of Umar radiallahu anhu, his understanding, the entire idea of maqas the sharia, the higher objectives of Islamic law based upon the decision making of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu and his khilafah. And all of it would not be enough to sufficiently cover this man radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So what I want to do tonight inshallah ta'ala is I want to get to the circumstances surrounding his death. But before that, I want to speak about him from the perspective of his leadership and him seeing himself and the ummah seeing him as the shepherd of this flock. Truly, the ra'i, the shepherd of this flock, as the Prophet ﷺ said, every one of you is a shepherd and every single one of you is responsible for their flock. Umar anhu was the shepherd of this ummah and he is rightfully called Amir al Mu'mineen the first person in history to be called the commander of the believers. And by the way, that was from the fiqh of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And it just fits him so perfectly. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu was, his title was Khalifa to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Khalifa of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu understood that, you know, instead of it being Khalifa to Khalifa to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Khalifa of the Khalifa of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and then the Khalifa, which means successor, the Khalifa of the Khalifa of the Khalifa of Rasulullah then you should find some other title that fits this position. And so Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was the first person to be addressed with this lofty title of Amir al Mu'mineen, the commander of the believers. And when we look at his Khilafah, we find that one of the things that made him such a worthy Khalifa, such a worthy leader, was that he never felt worthy. Never in his entire history as a Khalifa did Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu feel like he belonged. Did he feel like he had arrived? From the very beginning when he assumes the Khilafah and he was so exhausted from the very start when Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu appointed him as such to the last moment of his life when he is laying in the dirt and he is breathing his last, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu did not feel a sense of entitlement to this lofty position and that's why he was so good at it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him worthy due to his humility because the more you lower yourself, the more that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises you. And subhanAllah, as I was reading through these moments and trying to choose the incidents to illustrate what it means to be a shepherd of this ummah, you know subhanAllah from the very beginning when he gives his first khutbah, as he stands on the manbar and he realizes he's standing on the place that the Prophet ﷺ stands, he says, I'm not worthy to stand in the place the Prophet ﷺ stood. So he gets down and he says, this is where Abu Bakr stood radiallahu ta'ala anhu. I don't belong in the place that Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu stood. So he gets down to the very lowest step and he addresses the people. And subhanAllah, that is where he makes this dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his inaugural khutbah. Allahumma inni la'ifun faqawwini wa inni shadeedun falayyini wa inni bakhilun fasakhini. Oh Allah, I am weak, so make me strong. Oh Allah, I am harsh, so make me gentle. Oh Allah, I am miserly or I may be stingy at times, so make me generous. This was his dua radiallahu ta'ala anhu as he assumed the position of leadership over this ummah and we know that Umar radiallahu anhu's khilafah is defined by justice. So much so that a tyrant would fear Umar, but you would never fear tyranny from Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. You never had to fear being oppressed by Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So I wanted to go through some of these things, subhanAllah. And first and foremost, his fear of Allah with the ummah, 
his fear of Allah with the Ummah and being asked about the Ummah because that's ultimately the fear that he carries with him at the moment of his death. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, one time he asked Salman al-Farisi radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, am I a king or a khalifa? He said, if you take from the land or the money of the Muslims a dirham or less that does not belong to you, then you're a king. And if you uphold the rights of the Muslims and you don't cheat them, even with a dirham or less, then you are a khalifa. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu started to weep and he started to seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When it came to the people that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu would be asked about, subhanAllah, look at how noble he is. He said, Wallahi, if I live long enough, I will not leave a single widow from the people of Iraq in need of anyone but me. She will never need anyone else. I want to take care of the armala, of the widows of this ummah. I want to take care of the orphans of this ummah. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was exhausted of the thought of the animals. SubhanAllah, one time he walked up to a camel and the camel looked exhausted and he put his hand on the camel and he said, I fear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause you to testify against me on the day of judgment. And he started to weep. He said, I swear that if a sheep dies on the shore of the Euphrates, I fear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold me accountable for it on the day of judgment. That was who he was and this is what he imparted upon the ummah. One of the authentic narrations from Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, one of the things he said to the believers, it's so profound. And I want you to think about the khutbahs over the last few weeks. He said, تَزْعُمُونَ أَنَّكُمْ مُؤْمِنُونَ وَفِيكُمْ مُؤْمِنٌ جَائِعٌ you consider yourselves to be believers. And you have a hungry believer amongst you. So his admonishing of the ummah as well as admonishing himself. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, and the most frequent verse that you would hear Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu recite. And that tells you a lot about a person, right? The verse that he would recite so frequently. وَلِمَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ جَنَّتَانِ وَلِمَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ جَنَّتَانِ And for the one who fears the standing before his Lord is two gardens. He was so afraid of that standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and being asked about those that were under his care. So what did he used to do? He used to seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He used to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He used to ask Allah for help. And you never saw Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu during the day except that he was walking between the people in their marketplaces and around tending to their needs and you never saw him at night which is going to be the bulk of our discussion before we get to his death except that he was walking through the streets and caring for the members of his ummah. He was also a man of shura and this is something that's very important because the Prophet sallallahu said that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was what? From the muhaddathun, those who were divinely inspired towards the truth. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was so right that the Qur'an agreed, upon, uh, agreed with him on multiple occasions. Now at that point, wouldn't you have a chip on your shoulder? That the Qur'an came down in agreement with me, right? That the Prophet sallallahu would praise me and say that I am like a man who the angels speak to? Wouldn't you have a chip on your shoulder? But Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, his khilafah is marked by what? Shura. He used to see consultation from people. He used to, first and foremost, consult who? They said he would consult the Sabiqun, the first Muslims. He would look to the people of Badr. And then after the people of Badr, who are the best people, those were his, his most frequent people to consult, he would look to Ahlul Qur'an, to the people of the Qur'an. He looked at the people who memorized and who lived the Qur'an. And then he looked to the youth, and this is something that's very important by the way, that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu used to consult young people in the ummah. And this is something that Imam al-Zuhri rahimahullah ta'ala was once giving khutbah. And we know Imam al-Zuhri by the way, great hadith collector, the first person to formally collect hadith in this ummah. And he stood up and he addressed the youth and he said, لا تحقروا أنفسكم Don't belittle yourselves because when Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu used to face a difficulty and when he needed to consult, he would call the young people around him and he would seek their shura, he would seek their advice. Because he saw sharpness and purity in their thoughts. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu would uplift the youth in his ummah and he would seek their consultation. And he would put them in a high place, subhanAllah. And this was part of his wisdom in creating succession after him in the, in the arena of knowledge, in the arena of policy making, 
in all sorts of things. We also see that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu had a great preference to Ahlul Bayt, to the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We mentioned that when he went to Jerusalem, he put who in charge? You guys should remember this. Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And subhanAllah, there are so many different narrations in this regard. Uh, one of them, which is, uh, which is a beautiful one that I came across, that you know, one time uh, a man complained to Umar radiallahu anhu about Ali radiallahu anhu. And in the khilaf of Umar, the, the most ordinary person could bring the chief of the Sahaba and say, I want judgment, including Umar radiallahu anhu. You could bring Umar radiallahu anhu in front of Ali, in front of Shuraih, in front of other companions and say, I have a complaint against him. And that companion would have to sit and have to listen and have to be impartial, even with the Khalifa sitting in front of them. So in this situation, a man came and he brought Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu and he, he said to Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu that I have a complaint. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he called Ali radiallahu anhu over and he said, uh, come O Abu al-Hasan. He called him by his kunya, Abu al-Hasan. And he sat them both down. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he judged in the favor of the other man. This was something that used to happen frequently amongst themselves. And Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu looked upset. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he was afraid. He said, he said, Ya, ya Abu al-Hasan. He said, do you feel like I wronged you? Did I, did I not give you justice in this regard? And he said, you didn't treat me and my opponent equally. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, what did I do wrong? And he said, Ya Amir al muminin you called me by my kunya. You called me Abu al-Hasan, and you called him by his first name. So you were not just to the man when you called him to sit next to me. SubhanAllah, look at the way these people think. Like there was some favoritism in the way you called me over. Because you didn't say Ali and call the man by his first name. You said Abu al-Hasan, which means there's a connection there. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he breathed a sigh of relief and he kissed Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu on, on the forehead and he said, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never allow me to be in a land where Abu al-Hasan is not. May Allah not let me dwell in a land that Abu al-Hasan is not, meaning I need this man next to me. Uh, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, he talks about the favoritism that Umar showed to the people of the household. So Usama ibn Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhuma the beloved one, the son of the beloved one of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Abdullah ibn Umar noticed the way that Umar was treating him. And Umar radiallahu anhumah said to him that, look, Usama is more beloved to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam than you are. And the father of Usama, being Zayd, was more beloved to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam than your father. Usama ibn Zayd. Usama was more beloved to the Prophet Sallallahu than you, and by the way, his father was more beloved to the Prophet Sallallahu than your father is. So he would always give gifts to Usama ibn Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. He would treat him in a certain way. One time Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, he went to the house of, uh, of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and he knocked on the door, and Umar radiallahu anhu didn't answer his own son. Then as he's walking out, al Hussein radiallahu anhu was on the way to the house of Umar. And Abdullah ibn Umar tells him that he's probably not home because he's not answering. So Umar comes out afterwards and he tells Al Hussein, why didn't you come to me? I was waiting for you. And he said, well, I saw your son on the way out. And he said that you weren't, you weren't taking anyone at that time. He said, no, no, you're different. <laughs> you're different. He treats him even better than he treats his own family. Why? Because this is the beloved one of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So his idea of shura, his idea of preference, his idea of love is fully guided as well by this way that he loves Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The concept of awqaf, the concept of the endowments was a theory that started at a very minimal level with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But it was under Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu that this concept grew where people were donating their lands and setting up endowments to take care of the travelers, to take care of the sick, to take care of the orphans and the widows. That was all under Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Because he called out to the Muslims and he said, listen, who amongst you will donate his garden for Allah so that it won't just bear him fruit in this life, but it will be a means of his success on the day of judgment. And he said, here, this is the garden that the Prophet gifted me on the day of Khaybar. I'm giving it to Allah. 
I'm giving it for the sake of Allah. And so the Sahaba started to come forward and they started to donate their gardens for the sake of Allah. It was from that that this concept of awqaf actually became a system in the ummah. So that's from the wisdom and the, and, and the foresight of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And as I get to now, you know, subhanAllah, the way he suffered with the Muslims. You know, one of the things that happened with Umar radiallahu anhu, the man who had 14 patches in his garment, is that he got to a point where he no longer had any money to take care of himself. So he consults the Sahaba even on that. And he says to them, listen, what am I entitled to? Because um, I no longer have any earning coming to my house. So what am I entitled to from Baytul Mal? I don't want to wrong anyone. So some of the Sahaba, they said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, you know, you're entitled to a fine garment. You're entitled to all of your meals and your family's meals. You're entitled to a riding animal. And whatever you need to conduct your affairs, your armor, whatever you need to conduct your affairs as Amir al-Mu'mineen. Sa'id ibn Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, you eat and you feed others. That's what you're entitled to. Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu told him two meals. The Khalifa of the Muslims, you're entitled to two meals from Baytul Mal. Umar radiallahu anhu went with that opinion. And then he asked them, he said, well, what about his clothing? They said that you have a winter cloth and a summer cloth. So one for the winter, one for the summer and an animal to take yourself to Hajj and to Umrah. And then your regular stipend that any Muslim receives from Baytul Mal. And Umar radiallahu anhu liked that because he said, I'm only one of the Muslims. This was the Khalifa of the Muslims. And subhanAllah, the stories are so many. We mentioned when he went to Jerusalem, when he said, Allahumma tahir thawbi min amwal al-Muslimin. Oh Allah, purify this garment from the money of the Muslims. I'll share with you this one story. At one time, some uh, perfume came to him from Bahrain. And he said, I wish there was someone that could, uh, that could weigh the content. You know, like how, how strong the perfume is, the musk is, if it's how, how concentrated it is. And Atika, who's Atika, by the way? You guys should remember this from the Khatira last night. His wife, and also the the daughter of Zayd ibn Amr, the sister of Sa'id ibn Zayd. Okay, so Atika bin Zayd, radiallahu ta'ala anha, she says, I can do it, I can weigh it for you. And Umar radiallahu anhu said, no. She said, how come? He said, because I'm afraid that you'll take some of it and you'll put it on your neck or on your hand, and that way you'll take more than the other Muslims would. He wanted to give it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't even want this much to come on you. <laughs> Because it might be zulm, it might be a form of transgression that you take more than the other Muslims. So this is the way that he was, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And this especially showed in Amr Ramada, which is known as the year of ashes, where the famine hit the ummah so strong that they were praying janazah on tens of sahaba every day in Medina. And people were coming from all over asking for help the animals were starving, the animals were actually attacking people so that they could eat, so it became just a dangerous situation for the Muslims. And Aslam radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says that we were afraid that Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu was going to die hamman bil muslimin, out of his worry for the Muslims. So beyond just the physical toll that it would take on him radiallahu ta'ala anhu, we were worried that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was going to die hamman bil muslimin because of how much worry and anxiety he had over the Muslims. And he used to make this dua, Allahumma la taj'al halaka ummata Muhammadin ala yadi. Oh Allah, do not let the destruction of the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa come at my hands. Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, we were making dua for the famine to end, not because of the pain of the famine, but the fear of losing Umar radiallahu anhu to the famine. Like losing Umar would have been worse to this famine than losing anyone else, including ourselves. So we were so worried that we were going to lose him radiallahu anhu. He changed colors because of the deprivation that he experienced. His body changed, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He took an oath by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he would not eat from any yogurt, from any, from any milk, any butter, or any meat until the people could afford them and take care of them. 
And subhanAllah, the people feeling sorry for him, uh, they would buy him things. And so there was once a man that brought Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu a piece or, or, or a can of yogurt uh, for him and said to him, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, I bought this for you as a gift. I want you to eat from an Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, gave it away in charity. And he said, I don't like to eat what the Muslims can't eat. And he was once sitting, and, and uh, as he was sitting, his stomach actually started to rumble. And this is something, subhanAllah, that I want you to think about, that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was sitting in his home, and his stomach started to rumble so much that people would hear it, and all he would eat was what? Whatever oil he could find, whatever he could, whatever he could get off of the lid of something, some bread sometimes, and that was, the, that was it. And he had this famous thing that he would say to his stomach, he would say, Qarqir, he said, rumble or don't rumble. He's talking to his own stomach. He said, go ahead and rumble or don't rumble, but I swear by Allah that you will not be full until the children of the Muslims are able to eat. That's a leader. That's a shepherd. Refuses to eat what his own ummah cannot eat. People would bring him meat, and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu would say to them, I will not touch this meat until every single one of the Muslims can afford to eat meat, not having it. People would bring him gifts of fruit, and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu would take the grapes, and one by one he would, he, would, he would take them apart, and he would start handing them to the people outside, and he would not even take a bite of those grapes. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, one time he even comes home and there's a narration, subhanAllah, about his son. And his son had a piece of watermelon. You know, these concepts come to life really when you're looking at these stories. His son had watermelon. And Umar radiallahu anhu walks in and his eyes get big. And he says, what is this? Ibn Amir al-Mu'mineen ya'kulu batikh? The son of Amir al-Mu'mineen eating watermelon? In the time of, of, of Ramadan, in this time of famine? And he starts to chase his son around the house to take the watermelon from his hand. And his wife says to him, Ya Umar, he purchased it from his own money. He purchased it from his own money. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, until the, the children of the ummah can eat this, it shouldn't be eaten by our children. It has to go out there. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu had this famous saying, قَالَ كَيْفَ يَعْنِينِي شَأْنُ الرَّعِيَّ إِذَا لَمْ يَمَسَّنِي مَا مَسَّهُمْ he said, how can I consider myself to be a shepherd of this ummah when I am not touched with what my flock is touched with? All of this idea of responsibility for the ummah, love for the ummah, care for the ummah comes from Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu and this was his attitude in all times. In the time of the famine and otherwise that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu hated that he would eat what the ummah could not eat or that the ummah would suffer what he himself would not feel. Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, he says that one time we were at Hajj, and this is changing the culture of the people. And Safwan ibn Umayyah, he made some fancy food for him, and it was on a platter that was carried by four men. So these four men that were servants carried the food over to him. He's Amir al Mu'mineen, and he used to do Hajj every single year. And they put it in front of him, and then the four men retreated and they started to stand on the side. And Umar radiallahu anhu looked at them and he said to Safwan, he said, aren't they going to eat? And he said, no, no, this is for us, not for them. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he took his stick and he poked Safwan, he almost knocked him over. And he said, who are you people to give preference to yourselves over these servants? And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he told all four of the men, he said, sit down, this is in Hajj. He said, sit down and eat. And they were, they were shy, they're like, is he serious? He said, sit down and eat. And Umar radiallahu anhu stood and he assumed the place that they were assuming. This is the leader of the Muslims. Whether they were Muslim or not Muslim, this was how Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was. And subhanAllah, the, uh, the examples in this regard are so many. I literally have about 30 stories in front of me. I can't go through them all. Uh, you know, of governors that would send Umar radiallahu anhu a special dish and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu would send them back a really mean letter about why they're sending him a special dish. Because Umar radiallahu anhu considered it a form of bribery. Don't send me this stuff. Don't send me these clothes. Don't send me these dishes. Take care of those that are under your care and be the way that you are so that when you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are not taken to task. And so the most famous thing that he becomes 
uh, known for radiallahu ta'ala anhu is his night patrols and these night patrols if you remember there was an incident with Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu just so you know that Umar was constantly trying to live up to Abu Bakr right that's what he said you've exhausted anyone that comes after you because no one can be as good as you remember that time that Umar radiallahu anhu followed Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu out when he was the Khalifa and he found him serving an old woman look at what that did to him Talha ibn Ubaidullah radiallahu ta'ala anhu he said one time I saw Umar radiallahu anhu leaving his house late at night and he kept on going to the same house on the outskirts of Medina it's almost an identical story by the way and he said, so I got curious, so I, I followed him one night to see which house, why he keeps on going to this particular house. So he said, I went there, and in the morning, when Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu left, I went inside and I saw an old woman. I knocked on the door and an old woman answered, and she had a disability and she was also blind. And I asked her, I said, who is that man that comes to you? And she said, he's, he's a man who just likes to do, so subhanAllah, he never even told her he was the Khalifa. He's a man who likes to do khayr, he's a man who likes to do good. He comes out, he cooks for me every day, he cleans my house, and then he leaves. SubhanAllah. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, uh, Talha radiallahu anhu says, how long has he been coming to you? She said, for years. Years. SubhanAllah, years. The man who is the most powerful man in the world and now commands the responsibility of almost every major city in the world. For years, he was making it a point to come out to my house and to cook for me and to clean. And he never even once bothered to say to her that he was Amir al-Mu'mineen. Talha radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, I put my, my head down and I started to say, وَيْحَكْ يَا Talha, Woe to you, O Talha. Trying to follow or find fault with Umar radiallahu anhu. Like what a shameful act that you did. Like if you had any dhan, any bad suspicion inside of you about this man. What a man, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that with all of that responsibility was still finding time to do that. And this was following in the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and in the way of his predecessor, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So what are some of the other famous incidents with Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu? Uh, probably the most famous one is one that involves himself and his wife Um Kulthum bint Ali. May Allah be pleased with them. Um Kulthum was the daughter of Ali and Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anhuma and the wife of Umar al Khattab radiallahu anhu. And one night Umar al Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu goes out and he sees this wool tent. And it was the first time that he sees this tent and he sees this man that is sitting outside the tent looking nervous. And he can hear a woman in pain, screaming in pain inside the tent. So Umar radiallahu anhu says, uh, Assalamu alaikum, ma sha'nuk, what's going on? He says, Jazakallah khair, mur, go ahead. Just leave. He didn't know who he was. Be on your way, thanks for asking, but please go away. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, Can you tell me what's happening to the woman that's inside the tent? He said, Jazakallah khair, can you please go? Like, you're annoying me now. Stop asking all these intrusive questions about me. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, can you just tell me what's going on with her? Because I'm hearing her screaming in pain. What's going on with her? And he said, you know, my wife is giving birth. Umar radiallahu anhu said, is anyone there inside with her? He said, nope. So mashallah, the man sitting outside while his wife is about to deliver a baby all by herself. <laughs> There's no woman inside, no nurse inside, no one to help her. She's just going through the pain of labor by herself. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he goes home and it's late at night and he says to Umm Kulthum, this is how he presents the opportunity to Umm Kulthum. He says, do you want to accept a good deed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is presenting to you? Like you want me to tell you about a great opportunity for you of khayr, of ajr? Not like, come on woman, let's go, we got to help someone out. Like he's telling Umm Kulthum, there is a khayr, there is a good deed, there is reward for you that is waiting for you. Do you want to participate in this reward that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending your way? So she said, of course. So he said, come with me. There's a woman that's delivering. And Umar radiallahu anhu, he says, what, what food do we have in the house? So she points to some flour. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he takes the flour and he takes some animal fat. He carries it together. He is the Khalifa of the Muslims, walking with Umm Kulthum radiallahu ta'ala anha. 
the first lady of the Ummah, right? The granddaughter of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the daughter of Ali Radiallahu Anhu, the wife of Umar Radiallahu Ta'ala Anhu. And they go to this house. Umar says, this is my wife, she's going to help your wife out. The man says, go ahead. She goes inside. Umm Karthum is helping this woman deliver a baby. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says, help me set this fire. They're getting some wood together, setting the fire. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu starts cooking. And as, he ma- as he's making the food for this man, this man's a, a, a Bedouin. He's just traveling through Medina. He has no idea what's going on here. After that, his wife delivers inside the tent. And she says, uh, you know, Umm Karthum calls out and says, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen. Congratulate your friends. Congratulate your new friend on his baby. And the man goes, Amir al Mu'mineen? <laughs> like, subhanAllah, I forgot that I'm having a baby. Wait, you're, you're Umar ibn al Khattab? You're Amir al Mu'mineen? SubhanAllah, that was the extent to which he would do so. And Umar radiallahu anhu said, Don't worry about it. Don't be afraid. He said, uh, Help me put this food into, into some plates. And he said that uh, tomorrow, come to me. And inshallah ta'ala, there will be some, some payment for your newborn child. Something to help you all along with your newborn child. So this is Umar radiallahu anhu literally going out at night to take, to, to literally deliver babies with his wife for a traveler that is unknown and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu is unknown uh, to him. Now, what gets really interesting with these night patrols, and I think is often missed beyond the inspiration of it, because I want it to be practical as well, is that Umar radiallahu anhu derived policy from these night patrols. He derived policy from these night patrols. What do I mean by that? Abu Ubaid radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that one time Umar radiallahu anhu was walking and he saw an old blind man who was begging. So he tapped him on the shoulder and he says, which of Ahl al-Kitab are you? Which of the people of the book are you? Meaning, are you a Jew or are you a Christian? So he says to him, I'm a Jew. And he says to him, why do I see you begging? Why are you begging like this? And he says to him, because the jizya has become difficult on me in my old age. The jizya was the tax that the people of the book paid for protection in lieu of zakah. And it was even less than the zakah in the time of Umar. But he said, it's hard for me to pay the jizya. And I'm an old man and I can't take care of myself. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu takes him to his own home. He says, أَخَذْنَا مِنْكَ الْجِزْيَةَ فِي, شبيبة في شَبِيبَتِكَ ثُمَّ ضَيَعْنَاكَ فِي كِبَرِكَ He said, we took the jizya from you when you were young and then we lost you when you were old. No way. He takes him to his own home. And he cares for him in his own home. And then Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu calls for the keeper of Bayt al-Mal. And he takes the man to him and he says, take care of him and make sure that he never has to beg again and make sure that the elders from the people of the book from Ahl al-Kitab never are begging. We have to take care of them. We're not going to punish them because they're elderly. We're not going to take the jizya from them and then lose them when they are old. They're also entitled. So he's deriving policies while he's doing these night patrols. One of the most famous incidents in this regard is that uh, one time he was, he was walking by a house and he heard a child crying and he saw a fire that was coming you know, from outside of the home. So he said, Ya Ahl al O oh people of light, O oh people of the light, because he didn't want to say, Ya Ahl al Nar, O oh people of the fire. So he said, Ya Ahl al O oh people of the light. He said, What's going on in there? So the woman calls out and she says, My baby is hungry. Umar radiallahu anhu says, You know, why don't you feed him? Because it was a, a, a breastfeeding baby. Feed your child, nurse your child. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu starts to walk away and the child yells louder. And she's holding her baby and she's doing this. But she's not feeding her child. So Umar radiallahu anhu comes back to her and he says, Ardi'i tiflik. Why don't you feed your child? And she doesn't answer him. Umar radiallahu anhu moves away and the child screams louder. So he comes back and he says, will you breastfeed your child? You know, what, what, what a bad mom you are. Would you breastfeed your child? Why are you torturing your child? And she says to him, لِأَنَّ عُمَرْ يُنْفِقْ لِلطِّفْلِ الْفَطِيمِ وَلَا يُنْفِقْ لِلْرَضِيعِ She said it's because Umar, she doesn't know it's Umar, she said because Umar gives a more generous payment to the child that is weaned than the breastfeeding child. When Umar radiallahu anhu distributes from Bayt al-Mal, he had a higher portion that he would give to the child when it was older 
than when the child was still breastfeeding. And that did not fit this woman. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was so ashamed of himself. Listen to what Abdul Rahman ibn Awf radiallahu ta'ala anhu says. He said, Umar came to Fajr that day. And he was holding his beard and he was saying, Wayhaka ya ibn al-Khattab. Woe to you, O ibn al-Khattab. And ibn Awf radiallahu anhu says, that day when we prayed Fajr behind him, he was weeping so much that we didn't understand anything he read from the Qur'an. You imagine, subhanAllah, how much that incident shook him? We did not know what surahs he just read in the salah because of how much he was weeping, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was saying, how many children have you killed? That's what he's saying to himself. How many children have you hurt? How many children have been killed because of you, ya ibn al-Khattab? And so after he finishes the Fajr Salah, he says to them, tell your women do not wean their children early and they're going to receive the same amount of money both ways, whether it is Fatim or Walir, whether the child is still breastfeeding or the child is older. So he's changing his policies on the basis of what? On the basis of this interaction with the people. SubhanAllah, he's amongst the people. That's one of the greatest lessons that we learn from him of leadership, when they talk about ivory tower and disconnect and you don't understand the condition of your people. Umar radiallahu anhu literally walks the streets of the ummah at night and adjusts state policy on the basis of what he is encountering from the pain of his ummah radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Uh, one of those other times that he changed the policy, by the way, was one time he passed by the house of a woman and the woman was crying and she was uh, saying lines of poetry about being lonely. And Umar understood that this was the wife of a man that had been sent out in battle. So what does Umar radiallahu anhu do? He goes to Hafsa radiallahu anha, his daughter, in the middle of the night. And he knocks on the door. Hafsa radiallahu anha is worried, like, why are you coming in the middle of the night? Is everything okay? And Umar radiallahu anhu says, uh, by the way, I just want to ask you, Kam tasbir al-imra'a ala zawjiha? How patient can a woman be? Or how many months can a woman be patient when her husband is gone? <laughs> That's what you came to ask me? And she said, you know, one, two, three, four months is when it gets a little excessive. When you send out people in, in, in battle and they're gone for four months, it gets tough on her. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, what does he do? The next morning, he prays Salat al-Fajr and he announces a new policy. That when anyone is sent out in battle, this is in the middle of, you know, all of these, you know, battles with the Byzantines and with the Persians. He said that no one should leave for more than four months. SubhanAllah, he's adjusting on the basis of what? Hearing that woman complaining about her grief when her husband was gone for so long in a noble cause in jihad fi sabilillah. And of course, SubhanAllah, uh, the, the, they go on and on and on and on. You know, in one of these situations, I just, the end of the story, because it's a long story, that Aslam radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says, that one time Umar radiallahu anhu, he saw this, this hungry family at night and he spent the entire night collecting food for them and then he went and he started cooking for them and he was carrying everything and the smoke was coming through his beard as he was cooking for this large family and Aslam radiallahu anhu said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, let me carry these things for you and he said, are you going to carry my burden on Yawm al-Qiyamah? Atahmilu anni Yawm al-Qiyamah? <laughs> SubhanAllah, that's the fiqh of Umar. You're going to carry my burden on the Day of Judgment? This is my burden radiallahu ta'ala anhu we also find that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu uh, has moments where night patrols went wrong how did night patrols go wrong Umar was so tall that sometimes he could see over the walls so he had to lower his gaze when he was walking right and this is actually subhanallah something that was very unique to him other people Right? They, they'd have to put their hands up and they actually used to measure their ceilings. Some of the historians say they used to measure their ceilings first and foremost by saying, if I put my hand up, can I touch the ceiling or not? And then I'll try to build over that. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was just, or, or their walls, right? Umar was so tall that he has to put his head down when he's walking in the street so he doesn't accidentally see into people's homes. And so sometimes he heard things. Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu said that one time we were walking and we heard these loud voices inside of the door, and it was very clear that people were basically partying. They were drinking alcohol and they were partying. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu grabbed my hand and he said, do you know whose house this is? And 
I, I said no. Umar radiallahu anhu said, this is the house of Rabi'ah ibn Umayyah ibn Khalaf. And he said, they must be drinking wine right now. What do you think? And Abdul Rahman ibn Awf radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, I think wala tajassasu, <laughs> do not spy on the people. فَقَدْ, تجس, فقد تجسسنا أو فَقَدْ تجسسنا. Uh, So, you know, Allah tells us not to spy and we just are spying and we are assuming things of them. So we should leave them alone. So Umar radiallahu anhu said, you're right, let's go. Let's get out of here. And another time, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu actually saw a man and he heard some singing and he heard some, some poetry and he heard all of these things and Umar radiallahu anhu saw an old man and he was drinking wine and doing some other things that he should not be doing. And Umar radiallahu anhu shouted out to him and said, Ittaqillah, fear Allah, shouldn't you be waiting for your death? This is what you're doing in your old age? And the man said to him, no, you ittaqillah, you should fear Allah. You don't have a right to spy on me in my privacy. And Umar radiallahu anhu puts his head down, starts crying and he goes away and he says, Ya Allah, he's right. <laughs> I can't spy, I'm not supposed to see this stuff, I'm not supposed to know. And subhanAllah, the man cleaned himself up and he, uh, he felt so ashamed of that incident with Umar radiallahu anhu that that was a night actually that he made tawbah and he started to be regular in the masjid. So there are numerous narrations in this regard. And one of the things that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu used to say to the people that were uh, traveling with him at night, he said that know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has servants who cause some falsehood to die by ignoring it and not giving light to it by mentioning it. So, you know, sometimes you're going to hear things, you, you might suspect things. When we're doing these night patrols, we're out to take care of the ummah. We're not out to spy on the ummah. And that's actually something that's very important when you're asking about people. In what spirit are you asking about them? In what spirit are you asking about them? Are you asking about them in a way like, oh, have you heard about this person? We haven't seen them for a very long time. Or are you asking about them from a place of concern? And the greatest story, bidnillahi ta'ala, that we'll end with when it comes to the night patrols is of course the time that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu went out with Aslam. And as he was traveling the night, he overhears a conversation between a mother and her daughter. And the mother is telling her daughter to mix the milk with water, okay? And then to sell it in the marketplace. And she was a widow. And that was an orphan girl, so it was just the two of them. So she said, take the milk and mix it with water and then go sell it in the marketplace because this is how we're going to make a living. And the daughter says to the mother that, oh my mother, don't you know that Umar radiallahu anhu prohibited this? Amir al-Mu'mineen, he stopped us from doing this. He prohibited us from mixing the milk with water because it's a form of deception. She said, wa ayna Umar? And where is Umar? And she responds, Ya Ummi, ma kuntu li uti'uhu fil alam wa ukhalifuhu fil sir. Oh my mother, I'm not going to obey him in public and then disobey him in private. In kana Umar la yarana, fa ilahu Umar yarana. If Umar doesn't see us right now, the Lord of Umar sees us. And Umar radiallahu anhu hears this entire thing. So Aslam, he says that Umar radiallahu anhu tells me, mark that door. All right, mark that door. He goes home that night and he gathers his sons. He said, who amongst you needs to get married? <laughs> SubhanAllah, he didn't see the girl. He didn't want to punish the mom. He said, that voice is a voice of taqwa. That's a voice of piety. So he said, who amongst you needs to get married? So his son Asim was the only one of his sons that was not yet married. Umar radiallahu anhu says, all right, come with me. After Fajr, they pray Fajr. He takes his son Asim, he knocks on the door, and he asks the mother if her daughter is married or not. <laughs> and he proposes on behalf of his son Asim to that young girl, the daughter of that mother, who said, where is Umar anyway? And subhanAllah, it was through that mom that she would give birth to a daughter named Layla, and Layla was the mother of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So subhanAllah, that incident is the incident from which Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was born. <laughs> was Umar hearing 
that young girl of taqwa that would become the eventual grandmother of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz radiallahu ta'ala anhu. That's incredible, subhanAllah. That was the way that Allah put barakah in his thought, blessing in his thoughts. And look what the ummah benefited. The first reviver of this ummah, the first mujaddid of this ummah comes from that one incident. And when we talk about Umar being spoken to by the angels, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu wakes up one day and he says, oh, how I wish to see that young man from my descendants who's going to fill the earth with justice after it's been filled with injustice. And he said he has an interesting scar on his face. SubhanAllah, that was what he saw in his dream. And the dream of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu would come true. Everyone thought that it was going to be uh, Bilal, the son of Abdullah ibn Umar. And instead, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, when he was a young man, when he was actually a young boy, a horse kicked him in the face. And he had this scar on his face that was exactly what Umar radiallahu anhu described in his dream. And he was the prophecy of that dream of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Imagine subhanAllah if Umar just walked past that woman's house and said, you know what, let me teach, that, let me teach the mom a lesson. SubhanAllah, imagine if Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu did not take that particular action on that day. Now subhanAllah, when, when we get to the fitna and we get to the, the, the death of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, it's important to point out a few things. Number one, Umar radiallahu anhu's khilafah, if you lived in Medina at that time, right? This was the golden age, okay? This was the time where you knew justice was being upheld internally, where you knew that Islam was spreading around the world, where you saw the khair, the good coming back to Medina, Medina becoming a center of knowledge, unlike no other center in the world. All of these things are happening, the development of the awqaf, the development of the endowments, everything the Prophet ﷺ talked about that would come to pass in terms of good is happening in the khilafah of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. But then Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, one day, he stands up and he says, who amongst you remembers what the Prophet ﷺ told us about al-fitan, about the trials and tribulations? And Hudayfa radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, Ana ahfaduhu kama qal. I remember exactly what the Prophet ﷺ said about al-fitan, what he said about the tribulations. So Umar radiallahu anhu says, Inna ka alayhi la jari. He said that that's bold of you to say that. So what did he say? So Hudayfa radiallahu anhu responded, he said, Fitna to Rajul, fi ahlihi wa waladihi wa jarihi, tu kafiru has salah wa sadaqa wa ma'roof. He said, when a person is tested, or you know, the fitan that come in a person's daily life of their families, their, their spouses, their children, their money, their prayer and their charity and their enjoining good expiates all of the trials and tribulations that come as a result of that. Qala laysa hadihi urid. He said, that's not what I'm asking you about, O Hudayfa. He says, walakinni uridu lati tamuju kamauj al bahr. He said, I'm talking about the fitan, the trials and tribulations that the Prophet Sallallahu talked about that would hit the ummah like wave after wave after wave after wave. I'm talking about the heavy fitan, those trials and tribulations that the Prophet ﷺ talked about. And he said to him, لَيْسَ عَلَيْكَ بِهَا يَا أَمِيرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ بَأْسِ You don't have to worry about it, O Amir al-Mu'mineen. بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهَا بَاب مُغْلَقْ There is a closed door between you and all of that fitna. SubhanAllah, you are a closed door or there is a door between you and the fitna, O Amir al Mu'mineen. Umar radiallahu anhu said, Yuksaru al Bab, O Yuftah. Will the door be broken or will the door be open? Qala, Qultula, Bal Yuksar. I said to him, Rather the door will be broken. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he started to weep. And he says, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon, fa inna hu idha kusira. Lam yughlaq abada. He said, if that door is going to be broken, then it's never going to be shut again. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he buries his face in his hands crying. He gets up and he leaves the gathering. And none of the Sahaba understood what just happened. Everyone's looking at this exchange between Umar and Hudayfa and they're wondering what just happened. What did they discuss? What door are they talking about? Why did Umar radiallahu anhu suddenly cry? What does he mean the door can't be closed? 
after it is shattered. And afterwards, Hudayfa radiallahu ta'ala anhu explained that Umar radiallahu anhu understood that he himself was the door. And what Umar was asking was, was he going to die or was he going to be killed? And so him, the door being broken means that he is going to be killed. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu understands that that is going to set a wave of tribulations, a fitan, that he was a barrier between the ummah and that fitan. And subhanAllah, there are so many wisdoms for that. I mean, Umar radiallahu anhu makes the perfect leader. Literally, when you think about leadership, Umar radiallahu anhu is the perfect leader. He establishes justice. He doesn't allow nonsense to happen. You know, in fact, when the fitna started under, under the time of Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu, there was a man named Usaybih. And Usaybih used to be one of those people that would spread rumors and cause fitna in a community. And in the time of Umar radiallahu anhu, he was starting to spread rumors and start slander and start making things uh, worse. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he lashed him and he deported him. <laughs> he got rid of him. Usaybih made tawbah, came back to the community. And when the fitna started in the time of Uthman radiallahu anhu, they went to Usaybih. And Usaybih pulled up his shirt and he said, see these? Alamani al-rajl al-salih. The righteous man taught me a lesson. Don't even get me started. I'm not interested in the gossip and the rumor mongering and the things that will start to bring tribulation to this ummah. So Umar radiallahu anhu was a door between the ummah and the fitna in his leadership style and in the fact that when you establish justice in that way, subhanAllah, then that justice transcends every single system and every single group within the ummah. However, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu knew that his time was coming near. And he had these two du'as that he would make. The most famous one, Allahumma rzuqni shahadatan fi sabilik, waj'al mawti fi baladi nabiyik, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. O oh Allah, grant me martyrdom in your cause, and let me die in the city of your Prophet. Hafsa and Abdullah would say to Umar, how are you going to die a shaheed in Medina? Battles don't happen in Medina. Right? Maybe in Persia, that's where we're hearing the stories, in Persia, in Asham, with the Byzantines. How are you going to die shaheed in Medina? He said, if Allah wants it to happen, it's going to happen. That's sidq in dua. That's truthfulness in dua. He just kept on making the dua. He wanted to die the death of a martyr and he wanted to die in the city of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He had another dua. He said, Allahumma la taj'al qatli ala yadi abdin sajada laka sajdatan yuhajuni biha yawm al qiyamah. Oh Allah, do not let me be killed at the hands of someone who prostrated towards you. He made sujood to you that he would argue against me on the day of judgment with it. Meaning don't let me be killed by a believer. So subhanAllah, his dua is to be killed by a non-Muslim in Medina as a shaheed. Three things that seem completely impossible, right? But that's the dua of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So how does this shahada come about? It starts with a man by the name of Abu Lu'lu'a al-Majusi, uh, whose name was Fayruz. And Abu Lu'lu'a was a captive from the Persians. And he was particularly taken by Mughira ibn Shu'ba. Now Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, in his wisdom, did not like that there would be captives in Medina because obviously, you know, things could get messy in that regard. So he didn't like that there would be captives that would be brought back to Medina and that that would become a threat, an internal threat to the community after these battles. But Mughira ibn Shu'ba asked for Abu Lu'lu'a in particular to be with him in Medina because Abu Lu'lu'a was a skilled craftsman. He used to make weapons of war. Right? And so he's someone that offers a particular unique service. And so he comes in and he works under Mughira ibn Shu'ba radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Now Abu Lu'lu'a complained to Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And Umar radiallahu anhu was a just man. He doesn't spare Mughira. We actually find other incidents where he takes Mughira ibn Shu'ba to task. Takes Muhammad ibn Maslama to task. Takes Sahaba to task. He does not show injustice because the person on the other side is not Muslim or of a lesser class or in anything, anything of that sort, right? But Abu Lu'lu'a complains that, you know, the commission that he's taking from the weapons of war are too much. It's, it's, it's too high and I'm working too hard. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he, he takes his complaint, he weighs the evidence on both sides. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu comes to the opinion that it was a fair commission that he was taking 
from the weapons that he was providing through the raw materials and things that were coming out of it, which was four dirhams. So Umar radiallahu anhu tells him that, you know, it's, it's not an unjust salary that he's taking or a portion that he's taking from you. And at the same time, he tells Al-Mughir ibn Shu'ba to be lenient with him, to be just with him. So do not, you know, uh, do not overdo it with him. Be gentle with him and be lenient with him. But Abu Lu'lu'a was enraged by just that judgment. So Abu Lu'lu'a, he goes back and he swears to himself that he's going to kill Umar al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu is walking by him one day in Medina. And he's making all of these different types of things. And one of the things that he would make was windmills. And he would make these spears. And he would make all of these different crafts. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu walks by and in a nice way, he says to him that I heard that you do these things very well. Uh, can you make me one of these also? And Abu Lu'lu'a says to him, Ya Amir al muminin I'm going to make one for you that the whole world is going to hear about. SubhanAllah. So what, you know, he's threatening him in a nice way. Umar is not illiterate or, or, or naive in this situation. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he walks away and he's laughing as he's walking away and he says, وَعَدَنِي بِالْقَتْلِ He just promised to kill me. So the Sahaba say to him, well, why don't we apprehend him and why don't we kill him first? He says, أَيُقْتَلُ عَلَى ظَنْ You want him to be killed over a suspicion? He said, no, absolutely not. That's my hunch from him, that's my sense from him, but it's the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever happens as a result of that. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, let it go. Now subhanAllah, there are these dreams that then start to happen. Dreams of other Sahaba and dreams of Umar. The first one is very interesting because it comes up in Jerusalem. Awf ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says, during the khilaf of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, I saw this rope that was hanging down from the heavens and the people were trying to reach it. SubhanAllah of the many dreams of Umar. So he says, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was three times the size of everybody else. So he grabbed onto it easily and he ascended. So I said, how come Umar radiallahu anhu is the only one that can grab the rope and can ascend? And it was responded to me, because he is the Khalifa of Allah on this earth, وَلَا يَخَافُ لَوْمَ تَلَامٍ And he does not fear the blame of a blamer, وَيُقْتَلُ shahidan, And he will be killed as a martyr. So three things, he's a Khalifa of Allah, a rightful Khalifa. And he doesn't fear anybody. He doesn't fear blame from anyone else. And he will be murdered and killed as a martyr. So Awf ibn Malik went to Abu Bakr. This is still in the time of Abu Bakr. And he told him the dream. And Abu Bakr said, call Umar and tell him what you saw. So Awf ibn Malik calls Umar ibn Khattab and he tells him uh, the dream. And Umar radiallahu anhu says, that's a whole lot for someone to see in their sleep. <laughs> like a sleeper, you saw all of that in your dream? And that was it. Umar radiallahu anhu didn't entertain anything beyond that. I mean, he fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's been given all of these glad tidings from the Prophet sallallahu but for his own tazkiyah, right? He wants to keep himself humble. SubhanAllah, remember when we were talking about Jerusalem? When Umar radiallahu anhu first went to Al-Jabiyah? Awf ibn Malik radiallahu anhu was there. And Awf says that Umar called me over. And he said, remember that dream that you had in the time of Abu Bakr? He said to him, yes, but you told me that, or you didn't seem to really be interested in hearing it. He said, no, no, I was just, you know, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't serious about that. He said, as for becoming the Khalifa, he said, but I'm, I'm thinking about your dream since you shared it with me in that time. He said, as for becoming the Khalifa, he says, that already happened. And he says, as for the second part, he says, wallahi, I don't fear the blame of anyone but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he said, the third part, he's asking him what his kids used to say to him, how am I going to be killed shaheed when I'm in Medina? Right? And he's, he's just kind of speaking out loud and thinking out loud, not questioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it's very interesting, right? He's coming out to Hashem and he's seeing these people that have been in battle all this time. It's, you know, how am I going to be killed? I wonder how I'm going to be killed as a shaheed in Medina. So that's the first dream. The second dream is from Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu anhu. What a beautiful dream. He was in Asham. And he woke up in the morning and he calls the people and he says that I saw an interesting dream last night. I saw that I had horses and crops. And then they started to disappear. 
So good things started to disappear. And so he said, I took it and I went to this Jabal, to this mountain. And I saw Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu standing in the distance. And Umar radiallahu anhu standing and looking at them. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is telling to Umar, come to me. Cross, cross over here. SubhanAllah, so he sees this dream of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam telling him, standing with Abu Bakr and telling Umar, it's time for you to come this way. So Abu Musa, he saw that dream and they said, why don't you write a letter to Umar telling him what you saw and he said, I don't want to be the one to break the news of his death to him. This is clearly an indication that he's going to die soon. And indeed, subhanAllah, that time, that was actually the year that Umar radiallahu anhu would die. And here's something that is very, very interesting. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu would die only a few days after returning from Hajj. Umar radiallahu anhu did Hajj every year of his Khilafah, 10 years in a row. And he was in Hajj. And the Sahaba describe Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu raising his hands in Arafah that year, saying, Ya Rabb, qad kabura sinni, I've gotten old, wa da'ufat quwwati, and my strength is leaving me, wa tasharat ummati, and the ummah has spread to the world. Take me back to you while you're pleased with me, O Allah. SubhanAllah, as if he knew, he's calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Arafah, 10 years in a row, 10 hajjahs in a row. And he's saying, Ya Allah, I've gotten old now. My time is running out. Ya Allah, take me back to you while you are pleased with me. Pleased with what I have done with your ummah. He gets back to Medina from Hajj. So the incident with Abu Lu'lu took place right before he went to Hajj. He gets back to Medina right after Hajj. And he gave only one khutbah between Hajj and his martyrdom. So it's Dhul Hijjah. The 21st of Dhul Hijjah, Yawm al Jumu'ah, 23 years after the Hijrah. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he stands up and he says, Ayyuha nas, O people, I saw a dream. So now Umar radiallahu anhu saw a dream as well. He said, I saw this dream where a rooster came up to me and it pecked me twice. And then the people said to me that you should appoint a Khalifa. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, I interpreted this to mean my death, but Allah will not cause his religion or this ummah to be lost. But he said, if I die, then the Khalifa is to, to be appointed by those whom the Prophet ﷺ was pleased with when he died, meaning the leftovers of Al-Ashr Mubashirin, the leftovers of those that were guaranteed paradise. So Umar radiallahu anhu now himself has seen a dream that he interprets as his death. Then comes the day of his death. So it is the 23rd of Dhul Hijjah, Salat al Fajr. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu walks in and he's 63 years old, just like the Prophet was 63 years old when he died, just like Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was 63 when he died. And there are multiple narrations. I mean, you can imagine how many people narrate the incident of the, the assassination of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And how many people were in the masjid when Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was assassinated that lived to record it in history and tell the story. The most extensive narration is from Amr ibn Maymun radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And he says that on that day, Umar radiallahu anhu came to Salat al-Fajr. And I was standing in the second line and there was no one between he and I except for Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. SubhanAllah. So imagine Salat al-Fajr, the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu You're standing in the second saf. Umar radiallahu anhu was leading the salah. He said, Ibn Abbas was in front of me. And I was standing right behind Ibn Abbas. And he said, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, before he would lead the salah, he would walk between us and he would straighten up our rows. And then Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu went to lead the salah. He says, Allahu Akbar. And in Salat al-Fajr, and by the way, of course, it was dark. Why, why would Abu Lu'lu'a choose Salat al-Fajr to assassinate him? Because you can't see anything in Fajr. It's dark. So Umar radiallahu anhu was leading Salat al-Fajr, and I'm praying behind him, and he said he read Surah Yusuf. And he cried a lot as he read Surah Yusuf. SubhanAllah. 
what an amazing you know, experience. Like imagine praying behind Umar radiallahu anhu salat al-fajr, he's reading Surah Yusuf and he's crying reading Surah Yusuf and he said he used to love to read Surah Yusuf in Fajr. So this was something that Umar radiallahu anhu used to do in Salat al-Fajr. And then Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu went into Ruku' and he went into Sujood and Abu Lu'lu'a, he had made this dagger that he sharpened from both ends. So he could stab both ways Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu and he poisoned both ends of the dagger and he was hiding it under his cloth, under his cloak and he was praying because even though he wasn't a Muslim, right? It's Fajr, no one can see anybody else. So Abu Lu'lu'a waited for him to go into sujood and as he was in sujood, Abu Lu'lu'a attacked him. And he stabbed Umar radiallahu anhu with that dagger up to nine times. Stabbed him in his back, stabbed him in his front, stabbed him from his sides. And the worst wound was right in the stomach of Umar radiallahu anhu. So after he, he hit him enough times and Umar radiallahu anhu was, was laid out, then he stabbed him the hardest right in his stomach under his navel. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he gasped and he said, Qatalani al kalb. The dog killed me. He knew, he remembered that incident, subhanAllah from that moment when he walked by him. And he recited, وَكَانَ أَمْرُ اللَّهِ قَدْرًا مَقْدُورًا SubhanAllah, right away Qur'an comes to his mind. And the affair of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was a decree to come true. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu ended his life with Qur'an. Uthman radiallahu anhu after Umar would end his life with Qur'an. When you talk about as-sabr and the sadmat al-ula, patience being at the first strike, the first thing that comes to Umar radiallahu anhu's mind when he stabbed is what? Qur'an. This is the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, except for the people that were right in the front, the other people in the masjid didn't know what was happening. So people were saying subhanAllah out loud, thinking that Umar radiallahu anhu forgot to, to go to the next position in salah. And the people that were around Umar, some of them started to help him, and then some of them went to pursue Abu Lu'lu'a. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, what's his concern as he's laying there about to die? He grabs the leg of Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu ta'ala anhu and he says, Salli bin nas ya Abdurrahman. Finish the prayer of Abdurrahman. SubhanAllah, get over here and finish the prayer. That's his concern. Abdurrahman ibn Awf, he goes up and he quickly, he reads Surah Al-Kawthar in the second rak'ah and he quickly finishes up the salah. In the meantime, Abu Lu'lu'a, he goes out of the masjid and he's stabbing people on the way. So he kills nine people on that morning, and he wounds 13. And just as he's getting through them, eventually the people apprehend him, and they throw a cloak on top of him, and as Abu Lu'la re realizes that he's surrounded by others, he takes his own dagger and he stabs himself three times in the chest until he dies. So he commits suicide in the masjid. SubhanAllah, think how this incident just went from Fajr, behind Umar bin Khattab, in Masjid Nabawi, listening to Surah Yusuf, a beautiful recitation, to now Umar radiallahu anhu laid out with nine wounds, nine sahaba that are dead, and this incident that they had never seen before. And so immediately after they finish the salah, they carry Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu to the house of Abdullah because Abdullah's house was the closest to the masjid, his own son. And at that point, Umar radiallahu anhu had lost consciousness. And they're trying to revive him. And Abdullah is calling out, Ya Abata, Ya Abata, O my father, O my father. They're trying to revive him. But Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was unconscious for some time. After sunrise, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu opens his eyes. What's the first thing he asks? He says, Asal al nas. Did the people finish their prayer? <laughs> SubhanAllah. What a shepherd. What an amazing human being. Like that's his first concern is, did the people finish their salah or not? Asal al nas And they said to him, yes, they finished their salah. He said, Alhamdulillah, la hadda fil Islam liman tarak as salah. Those that are slacking with their prayers, listen up. He said, Alhamdulillah, because there is no share of Islam for the one that leaves their prayer. There is no Islam in a person that abandons their salah. So he said, Alhamdulillah, the people finished their salah. That's his first concern. 
Asallad nas. Did the people pray as the blood is flowing from him? And then he tells Abdullah, sit me up. And he says to Abdullah, bring me some water. When he asks them for water, they think that he's going to drink water. But what does he start to do? He starts to do wudu. And Umar radiallahu anhu finishes his fajr prayer because he was stabbed and made unconscious in the second rakah. That's where his heart is. That's where his mind is. Then Umar radiallahu anhu, because of his strength, you know, anyone else would have died from those wounds right away. But because of how huge he is and how strong he is, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu starts to ask questions. He says, Man qatalani? He said, Who was the one that killed me? They said, Al Majusi. It was the Persian, that, 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 that person that you suspected that day. And he said, Alhamdulillah, the one who killed me is not someone who says, La ilaha illallah. Alhamdulillah. SubhanAllah, he's concerned about the Day of Judgment. I don't want a Muslim to be the one that killed me. And he's concerned about the implications to the Ummah. If someone who said, La ilaha illallah committed that crime, that's going to unlock another type of fitna in this community. And indeed, we see that in the time of Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So he's saying, Alhamdulillah, that the one who killed me was not a Muslim. He still cares about this Ummah. Alhamdulillah. He's not someone who says, La ilaha illallah. And then Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he asks for some laban, for some milk. And they brought him the milk. And his wounds was so severe that everything he drank came out of his stomach. So it would flow out of him immediately. So they called for a doctor. And the doctor saw the wounds of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, tried to patch up saw what happens when he drinks milk and the way that his body was responding. And he says to him, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, inna kamayyit fa'awsi. O commander of the believers, you're not going to make it, you're going to die. So whatever wasiyah you have to give, then give it now. You have either a few moments, maybe a few days max, but you don't have much longer, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, so whatever you have to say, say it now. What does Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu do? Number one, he calls Abdullah. And he says, Ya Abdullah, I want you to go around and I want you to see who I owe money. And I want you to make sure that you pay off every single one of those debts. And your father doesn't have much. So if I run out, or if you run out from my wealth, then distribute the debt amongst yourselves. It's not that he had big debts, it's that he had no money. He's the Khalifa of the Muslims, most powerful man in the world, he has no money. He said, so you and the kids take care of it. And he said, and if you run out, then go to Banu Adi, our tribe, and collect the money from them. And if Banu Adi runs out, then you can ask some of our close ones from Quraysh, but don't go any further than that. So at first he wants to take care of his debts. Then Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu reaffirms the shura. And he appoints those that will appoint the Khalifa after him, and they are the six people that are remaining from those who were promised paradise, except for one who would have been the seventh, and that was, talked about, Sheikh Yasser talked about him last night, Sa'id ibn Zayd. Why? Because Sa'id ibn Zayd is his brother-in-law, he's, he's, he is his cousin, and Umar radiallahu anhu wants to keep his family away from the Khilafah, he wants to avoid nepotism in any way possible. Some of the people say to Umar radiallahu anhu, why don't you appoint Abdullah as your Khalifa? Abdullah is literally a copy of Umar. He has a son who is exactly like him. And Umar radiallahu anhu says, no way. This affair is good for only one person from my family. If you want, he can consult, but he can't be a member of the shura. He cannot actually have a vote or be considered for the khilafah, but you can consult him. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu appoints the shura in that regard. And then he calls Abdullah and he says to Abdullah that I have one wish, subhanAllah, his dying wish. He says, go to Aisha radiallahu anha and give my salam to her. But don't tell her that Amir al-Mu'mineen sends salam to you. Tell her that Umar sends salam to you because I'm no longer Amir al-Mu'mineen. I'm no longer the commander of the believers. And I don't want her to think that what you're going to say to her comes from an official place. Just go to her and send salam from Umar. And ask her, but tell her that it is fully your right to say no to this. Ask her 
if she would give me permission to be buried in that spot beside the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. If she says no, that is adil. That's justice. That's her right. Don't pressure her. If she says yes, that's her fadl. That's her virtue. That's her showing kindness towards me. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma says, I went to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. And I found Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha weeping profusely. And subhanAllah, they said Aisha cried more when Umar died than when her own father Abu Bakr died. And they said to her, why? She said, because, she said, because Umar was the door between us and the fitna. He was the door between us and the fitna. She knew the implications of his death, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And in authentic narration, she says, Abu Bakr, I heard my father say, Wallahi ma ala wajhi al-ard, rajlun ahabba ilayya min Umar. Abu Bakr said, I swear by Allah, there is no one on the face of the earth more beloved to me than Umar. So he's loved by her father. He's loved by her husband, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He's the door between us and the fitna. Everyone in Medina is crying right now because they know that Umar radiallahu anhu is dying. So Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma says, Assalamu alaikum ya ummi, peace be unto you, my mother. I have a request from Umar. He sends his salam to you. And he asks for you to consider, but without any pressure, it's your right. If he could be buried next to his two companions, buried next to Rasulullah sallallahu and Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Aisha radiallahu anha. What, I mean, subhanAllah, you talk about a favor, you talk about a charity, you talk about giving something up. She says, I always envisioned that that would be my spot, that I'd be buried next to my husband and my father. I mean, this is her home. It's literally her room. The Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr are buried in her room. And she says, I always saw that I would be buried next to my father and next to my husband. But I know the place that Umar radiallahu anhu had with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So she granted it. Abdullah ibn Umar comes back when Umar sees Abdullah. He's laying down, he's barely alive at this point. When he sees Abdullah coming back, Umar radiallahu anhu says, sit me up. And says to Abdullah, what are you coming back with? He said, I'm coming back to you with news that is pleasing to you. He said, Alhamdulillah, that was the only thing that I wanted. But he said, after I die, go back to her again, just in case she felt under pressure. And ask her after I die, if she's sure that she wants to give up that place and don't pressure her. If she says no, maybe after, you know, if she's calmed down from the emotion, bury me amongst the Muslims in the Baqir and I'm, I'm satisfied with that. But that's her right. He doesn't want to wrong Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha in a moment of emotion. And Abdullah ibn Umar then puts the head of Umar in his lap. At that moment, people are coming in and some of the Sahaba are praising Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu says to some of those that praise him, he said, Atashhadu li yawm al-qiyamah bidhalik? Will you bear witness on the Day of Judgment with what you're saying? He's so afraid. Are you going to bear witness in front of Allah with what you are saying? And they're saying, yes, O Amir al-Mu'mineen. No one was dissatisfied with your khilafah. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu comes in. And Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu starts to mention all of these virtues. And Umar radiallahu anhu, he says, but what about all of these people? He said, I'm afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asking me about this ummah. I'm afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asking me about this ummah. And he said, if I could meet Allah and give everything of this world and not be punished or not be rewarded, then I would be satisfied. I just don't want to be punished for all of these people that were under my care. That is the ham, that is the wish of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And then subhanAllah, he does something very interesting in his last moments. He says to Abdullah, he says to him, Oh my son, put my head in the dirt so that when Allah looks at me, he'll have mercy on me. He'll see his humble servant and show mercy to him. Take my head off of your thigh and put my face in the dirt. Abdullah says, I don't want to do it. No, why? And Umar radiallahu anhu said, if this face is a face that belongs in hellfire, then you don't want it in your lap. And if this face is a face that belongs in Jannah, 
then the pillow of Jannah is softer than your thigh. So just listen to me, my son. Put my face in the dirt. SubhanAllah. This man who spread Islam to most parts of the world that you all are from today. Who is a person who the Prophet ﷺ praised over and over and over again. Who has the shahada of the Sahaba, the witness of the companions. Who died praying Fajr in Medina, Shaheed, next to the Prophet ﷺ. From the place that the Prophet ﷺ read Salah, in sujood. A Shaheed in Medina, a companion of the Prophet ﷺ guaranteed paradise. And he's saying to his son, leave my head in the dirt. So that maybe when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at me, then there would be mercy that is shown towards me. And Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, I was the last person to see him alive, meaning not from his family. Uthman radiallahu anhu entered in. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu with his face in the dirt, with his, with, with his face on the ground. And he said, woe to Umar if Allah does not show mercy to him. Ya wayla Umar, woe to Umar, innam yarhamahullah, if Allah does not show mercy to him. Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took his soul in that humble place. This is Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. This is the fear of Allah that he had from the moment that he became Muslim to the moment that he left this earth in the best way that any person could possibly want to leave this earth. This is a man who one day set out to kill the Prophet ﷺ and ended up being buried next to the Prophet ﷺ. I'm going to end here because of time that Abdullah, he then, he then says that we took his body and we washed his body. And by the way, Abdullah, when he would walk by the Hijr, the place of the Prophet ﷺ, you know, we say As-salamu alaykum to the Prophet ﷺ and to Abu Bakr and Umar. Every time he walks by, he says As-salamu alaykum ya abati. Peace be unto you, my father. Abdullah washed his own father. So Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhumah washed Umar radiallahu anhu's body. And then subhanAllah, even in his janazah, there was justice. So that none of those who were promised paradise leading janazah would indicate that they would be Khalifa. Suhaib al-Rumi radiallahu ta'ala anhu was chosen as the person to lead the salah of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So Suhaib ibn Sinan leads the salah of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And then they take the body of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu and they bury him next to the Prophet sallallahu and next to Abu Bakr. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with him. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah, he says that when Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was placed in his coffin and the people carried him, I was one of the people carrying Umar on my shoulder. And he said, there was someone around me or behind me that was making beautiful du'a. He said, فَالْتَفَتُّ إِلَيْهِ فَإِذَا هُوَ عَلِي I turned around and it was Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu behind me. This is in Sahih Muslim, by the way. فَتَرَحَّمَ عَلَى عُمَر He was saying, may Allah have mercy on you, O Umar. وَقَالَ مَا خَلَّفْتَ أَحَدًا أَحَبَّ إِلَيَّ أَنْ أَلْقَ اللَّهَ بِمِثْلِ عَمَلِهِ مِنْكَ You have not left anyone behind you who I would love to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his deeds, than you. وَأَيْمُ الله إِن كُنْتُ لَأَظُنُّ أَنْ يَجْعَلَكَ اللَّهَ مَا صَاحِبَيْكَ وَذَاكَ أَنِّي كُنْتُ أَسْمَعُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول جئت أنا وأبو بكر وعمر ودخلت أنا وأبو بكر وعمر وخرجت أنا وأبو بكر وعمر And he said, and I had a feeling that Allah would bless you with this noble place to be buried next to the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr because I remember the Prophet ﷺ would always say, I, Abu Bakr and Umar did this, I, Abu Bakr and Umar went here, I, Abu Bakr and Umar left here. فَإِن كُنْتُ لَأَرْجُوا أَنْ يَجْعَلَكَ اللَّهُ مَعَهُمَا And so I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted you their companionship. Finally, Aisha radiallahu anha, she says, this is her room, subhanAllah. The way that they're buried, the Prophet ﷺ is buried, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu is buried with his head to the shoulder of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and Umar radiallahu anhu is buried with his head to the shoulder of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. SubhanAllah, think about the way that they're buried. Abu Bakr with his head to the shoulder of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Umar radiallahu anhu with his head to the shoulder of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And Aisha radiallahu anha, she said that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam died, and I used to enter the room, I mean this is her house, she said, I would remove my, 
my, my, my hijab because I would say to myself, that's my husband. And then my father died. I mean, imagine the house of Aisha radiallahu anha. And I would walk into my room and I'd see the Prophet Sallallahu and Abu Bakr and I would remove my hijab because I told myself, well, zawji wa abi, my husband and my father. But when Umar radiallahu anhu died and he moved into my home, she said, I couldn't even bring myself to take off my hijab in my own home out of the haiba of Umar radiallahu anhu. SubhanAllah. Like the awe, the presence of Umar radiallahu anhu, even in death, I couldn't even remove my garments in my own home because Umar radiallahu anhu was there. Remember the Prophet said, I saw Umar radiallahu anhu in Jannah, or I saw his palace in Jannah, and I saw some of his women folk, and when they told me it was the palace of Umar, I said, I don't want anything to do with it because I remember the ghira of Umar. That's the, that's the position that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu had. And that final scene, dear brothers and sisters, and I apologize for going over time, SubhanAllah, you think about the people rising from their graves on the Day of Judgment. And I want you to imagine the scene when the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhumah rise from those graves and proceed to Ard al-Mahshar, to the place of assembly. And the Prophet ﷺ entering into Jannah, as he said, with Abu Bakr and Umar, with him like this, just as they used to walk. Why do I share that? Make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants you their companionship. Ask Allah with sidq in your heart, with truthfulness in your heart, Ya Allah, let me be resurrected with them. Ya Allah, let me sit with them. Ya Allah, let the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa call me over. Ya Allah, let me be in the house of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in Jannah. Ya Allah, let me have that companionship. Because the person that would die after Uthman radiallahu anhu, what was it? The dream of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and Abu Bakr and Umar. And so when we dream and we think, we think, Ya Allah, Gather us with them. Rahimakallah, ya Umar, wa radiallahu anka. May Allah have mercy on you, O Umar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with you for all that you put forth for this ummah. May Allah reward Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu for shepherding this flock in the way that he did. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him the ajr, the reward of everything that was born out of what he brought from concept to reality. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward him for the good that he acknowledged and that he was aware of and that which he was not aware of and that which he did not acknowledge. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be witnesses for Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, for the companions, for the family of the Prophet sallallahu on the day of judgment. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gather us with our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and with the companions. Allahumma ameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Jazakumullahu khayran wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.